welcome to the Bernard Lee Poker Show. Last week, we were very fortunate to speak to the 2021 Win Millions champion. It's a family affair this week because this gentleman was the first person to tackle him after the win. But he is a, a poker player in his own right, an excellent cash game player. But over the last several years, he has become known as a, a great YouTube vlogger. Many of you might know him as Johnny Vibes. Go on his YouTube page to see a lot of his uh, um playing, whether he travels the country, meetup games, and, and a lot of the World Series circuit bracelet, I'm sorry, World Series bracelet events as well. Welcome to the show, Johnny Moreno. Johnny, thanks for joining hey, thanks us here for on the Bernard Lee Poker Show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Bernard. Uh, that was a special moment when uh, Andrew won with that final card. It was, uh, it was surreal for me as an older brother. We're very close in age. And um, we've we've been very close our entire life. So I, I've been thinking about this and I feel like if that would have happened to me, the amount of joy that spilled out of my body and the amount of overwhelming happiness, I don't even think it would have been the same for myself. Right, right. Because like, I think when you're in that seat, it's a lot of uh, relief, a lot of adrenaline dump, a lot of mental overload. But for myself as like someone who's, you know, very close to Andrew, I was detached from all that. The only thing I was focused on was that card coming down and the joy that was accompanying it. So right. it was a special moment for me and uh, something that I'll never forget. Yeah, they talk about it a lot. My, uh, my son plays a lot of sports. My daughter plays a lot of sports. Watching it compared to playing in it, and it's just so different. And it's, you know, the joy of watching your kids or anyone close to you do something well um, you're so invested in watching them play. And like you said, when you're in the middle of it, whether it's playing poker or whether it's, you know, playing a sport or something or whatever the activity may be, you're so focused on that activity. It's not about the celebration right away. And, and I totally get it. And, uh, you know, you can kind of see it when you when you you're jumping up and down. He's almost collapsing into your arms out of probably mental and physical exhaustion after all of that, because it was such a incredible obviously almost 1.5 million dollar win um yeah. you came guys at said the right you... time too came yeah, at the yeah. right time he's he's and i i know the backstory you know he's been in poker for nearly 20 years he right. didn't go to college he tried college for a second but like when he was 19 years old he was diving into the poker world and you know 20 years he's almost four he's 39 almost 30 he's 38 now so almost 20 years of grinding and I just know the ups and the downs that he's experienced in his life, the ups and downs that he's experienced in his relationship with Christy and just everything. It's just a culmination, you know, having his first child being born in August, never having a million dollar score, never really having massive scores in tournaments, um, always kind of been a primarily a cash game player. So knowing the struggles that have been in their relationship and that they've had in their poker life, it just feels extra special to me. Like, I don't know, like whenever there are tribulations in your life, the ups feel that much more special. And sure. that's, that's also another reason why um, I was just so overwhelmed. And also he's never had a score of that magnitude. So it was, uh, it feels like a once in a lifetime thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, very few people have, I mean, you know, to have a 7 million, seven figure score over a million dollars, very rare to have that opportunity. Um, you, you guys, like you said, you're very close um, and you really kind of grew up playing poker together. I'd love for my listeners to kind of get the story from your side. We heard a little bit from Andrew of his side of how he started. Love to hear your side of how uh, you started and how kind of Andrew got you into this game and how you really start developing your game itself as, as really a, a solid uh, mid-stakes grinder that has been so successful for over a decade. Yeah, uh, definitely. So we had an interesting dynamic as, as like the older brother, I, I was tasked with a lot of the responsible type things. I was taking care of my younger siblings. My mom and I, you know, my mom got pregnant with me when she was 19. So, you know, and she was divorced and it was, uh, it was my responsibility to kind of lead by example in terms of responsibility. So 
I ended up uh, grinding through community college and uh, getting a software degree as uh, a two-year degree in software, getting a job, you know, it was huge because just the act of getting a degree, even though it was only an associate's degree and the act of getting a corporate America job, the family was super proud of me. They were just like, you know, I'm exceeding expectations in a lot of way. And then, you know, Andrew kind of felt that pressure of me leading by example. And he just, school wasn't for him right out of high school. And he fell into poker. And I remember for me, it was a big struggle because we didn't have a lick of gambling in our family. Like nobody really understood gambling. Um, I remember when he started playing poker, I just thought it was a dead end. And I thought that it was gambling. I didn't really think that there, it was a skill game just right. because of my ignorance, you know, and, um, and not having any experience in the gambling space. But when someone around you has a passion for something, someone so close to you, like your brother, uh, he was living with me at the time. That's impossible not to rub off on you. You know, like him going through hands and, and really attacking the game from a uh, analytical mind and the passion that he had around the game, just me living with him and seeing what he was into. It was impossible for me not to at least like learn the game, pick it up, develop some sort of love for the game. So that's initially what it was. It was, it was me trying to steer him away from poker, but right, also right. recognizing that he had a huge passion for this. And then because of that, that passion leaked over onto me into where I started sitting over his shoulder while he was playing online poker. And then I started following him to underground home games. And then I started asking him, you know, what do I do for me? the small blind with ace queen and then him going on a 45 minute tirade on what he thinks I should do. It's just, it, it was inevitable. You know, our relationship, it was just inevitable that I would basically be his unofficial protege, even though he's the younger one. And I had kind of directed him my whole life. The roles had kind of switched where he was kind of leading our family into uh, the abyss that is poker, you know, <laughs> There's uh, there's an endless uh, endless knowledge to be learned in poker. And the moment that you think that you have it figured out, right. you realize you don't, you know? Right, right. The poker gods bite you in your butt telling you, you're not as good as you think you are. Trust me. Exactly. <laughs> uh, how much older are you than, uh, than it's, it's We're only two years apart. So okay. like I said, my mom uh, got partnered with me when she was 19. So, you know, we're, you know, I'm, we moved around every two years to uh, unstable living situations. So I never went to, I never went to the same school for more than two years in a row. And I think as a result, Andrew and I kind of always had each other as friends. Yeah. You know, yeah, we didn't yeah. really develop our own friend groups because we were already moving on to the next city, to mm -hmm. the next school district. Right. So Andrew kind of was always my number one uh, best friend, which is kind of uncommon for brothers. You know, I feel like brothers fight a lot and yeah. we did, we definitely did our share of fighting, <laughs> our share of fighting, but because of the dynamic that we grew up in, I feel like it created this bit, really strong brotherhood that has endured through today, you know, I'm 40 and I see my brother like every week, you know, we talk on our own podcast that we have embraced the grind yep. and yeah, our relationship is just as strong as now as it has ever been. Yeah. And, and you know, you play, you have been playing cash for uh, many years or well over a decade um, and kind of mid stakes cash. We're not talking high nosebleed kind of, what has it been like for that? Because we will talk about your YouTube um, presence, uh, your vlogging and, and how that really has taken off. But well prior to that, you were a poker player. It's not that you are a vlogger that plays poker. It's really the other way around is that you played poker for so many years and kind of vlogging has kind of come into this space. How was it and what were your trials and tribulations playing cash poker for a living? Because, you know, everyone loves seeing the big scores, but people don't understand the grind sometimes of six sessions in a row where you don't win. Everyone's happy when we have a twenty five hundred five thousand dollar pot and, and can show it on on air. Right. But how many times do you struggle, 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 and flush draw doesn't get there, or you flop top set and they get runner, runner, and, and now you're going home with, you know, only job in the world where you can work X number of hours and go home poor, right? I mean, it's yeah. very rare that that happens. Talk about your trials and tribulations and how it got to the point where you really felt like you could steadily make a living at this, because it's really hard. 
Yeah, I, I remember the, the first day that I left my job as a software developer, uh, you know, with 401k health benefits and all these things. And I remember right. thinking like, if I, if I don't make good money playing poker, I can always go back and, and get right. a software job again. And, you know, the first, uh, I, I, I was doing, I was doing well right out of the gate, but you got to keep in mind that it wasn't that difficult to make money playing cash game poker. If you had a solid strategy 15 right. years ago, because right. the money was everybody, you could find a two, five game anywhere that was great. And, you know, there was probably a hundred two, five games on any given night in Las Vegas during this time. Right. So I, I was doing well, but naturally as you progress in any career, you want to make more money than the previous year and you want to get better and you want to further your career. And, you know, that's, that's easy to do 15 years ago in poker. You know, you could start out playing one, three, you could make $35,000 that first year, feel like it was amazing. But then the next year, you know, your, your goal is maybe 50,000 and the next year your goal is maybe 75,000. But then you reach a point where you're making around a hundred to $125,000 a year. And you realize that in order to make more than that, you need to get substantially better. You need to find better games and the games need to be big. And what's interesting about that is poker games were shrinking. They were getting smaller over the course of the last five to 10 years and they were getting tougher. So no, right. even if you, right. even if you got better in your own poker game, it didn't ensure that you were going to make more money than the next year. Right. And I remember I kind of plateaued about six years ago where I was in the hundred to $125,000 a year range. And I didn't really see great prospects for making more than that. And, and just as a natural, uh, ambitious human being that started sparking me, like, what else can I do to ignite passion in the game and what else can I do to keep things interesting for me? And that's kind of how, you know, creating the poker channel came about. Um, my, my five, 10 game had died that I was playing in, in San Diego on a consistent basis. That game was no more. So I was in a precarious spot where, how am I going to continue to make this good money with smaller games? Right. Um, and I thought it would be a perfect time to start a new project. And I, I remember those first couple episodes that I started, I didn't think anybody was going to watch them. I was just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just trying to get better at public speaking and, you know, perhaps trying to, um, develop some other avenues of interest at a time when I was unsure where the, the cash games could take me uh, as far as the ceiling was. And it, it took off after the seventh episode when I lost like $6,500 in a, in a 510 game in, in one session, I picked up the camera and I put it in my face and I was like, this sucks because like <laughs> this game doesn't run 24 hours anymore. You know, I got like eight hours a day that I can play this game. It might take me a while to win back 6,500. So I kind of shared that on my YouTube channel and the algorithm picked it up and they're like, wow, this is a real poker player that's right. making YouTube videos. So right. I think that alluding to what you talked about before, I wasn't scared to talk, talk about my thought process. I wasn't scared to say how I played hands. I was confident in my poker game. I think one thing that a lot of people have, have happened is there are newer poker players that are making YouTube content. So they're kind of more uh, afraid to just say what happened. Right. And, and like, you know, because people are going to show up in the comments and be like, oh, you played that like an idiot or right, right. what are you doing? Three betting with that hand. But for me, my confidence in my overall poker game, that part didn't bother me. Like if you were right. going to talk crap about my game in the comments, I was fine with that, you know? And I think that that's what, destroys a lot of people in the early stages is sure. they don't have that confidence. And you know, the, the, when you sign yourself up for YouTube comments, the, the YouTube comments, they're going to come, right. they're going to come uh, ruthless. Right. And, and uh, you know, we'll talk more about all of those little comments here and there, because that's, it's really true. Just when you are in the public eye, I remember the first time when I was writing uh, for the first time, ESPN, Boston Herald, card player, et cetera, boy, some of the comments you get. And I, I will tell you, at least from my personal experience, the first couple of years, you, it's hard not to take it personal. It's really yeah. hard not to take it personal. 100%. And, and, and after a while, you realize, and I, I heard, um, I, I saw uh, an interview that you had, and I think I, I completely agree with you, is, is that when somebody is making that kind of comment, they're making that comment through, a, uh, you know, through glasses that they're dealing with. 
And so whether it's jealousy, whether it's, you know, um, they feel it's unfair, the exactly. Yeah. Whether it's they're not playing well, whatever it is, you just don't know what's going on with their life. And so they're unfortunately, you know, spilling it over to you and they feel like if you're going to have this platform, I'm going to have this platform. And since I'm anonymous behind a screen, I can say whatever I want. And I, I, I like I said, the first year, I, I, I will tell you, it was, it was, there were times where I would have to call my editor and be like, what is this? We need to write a, you know, something on it. And he's like, whoa, whoa, easy, easy. This yeah. is, this is what you signed up for, man. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, and, you uh, and I, we didn't grow up in social media. So like, oh, no, exactly. We, we, we had to learn on the fly. Like I didn't even start creating YouTube content until I was like 35 years old or 36, right, right. 30, right. maybe 37 years old. So at that, at that point, like I'm not, I didn't grow up with social media. So when people start saying mean things to me on social media, it was on the job training. You know? Right, 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 right. You're like, Hey, you're insulting me. Um, I, I want to just, uh, also talk a little bit more about the poker world for you. Um, obviously playing cash, no limit. Um, like you said, I, you made a great point. I was going to, to make that comment. You already said it for me is that 10, 15 years ago, really the height of poker, right? Moneymaker 2003, Hashem wins in 2005. We move over to the Rio. And then when you say we, we're talking about the World Series. Mm -hmm. Now there is media galore. Jamie Gold's year, it's the height from about 2006 to 2011 was really the absolute height and boom of poker. Everything was going crazy. I mean, it was nuts, absolutely nuts. And like you said, you walk into a casino, you play a one three two five game, and you're competent at poker. There's no way you weren't, at worst, third best at that table. At worst, in my opinion. I, I, I mean, definitely there were some time. Where, if you weren't, yeah. you could just move to the next table. Over. 100%. That's right. I was just going to say, you can either move down or just move over and you'll be, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But like you said, as time moved on, this game got harder. People started now studying. It used to be, uh, I've talked about this with, with numerous uh, people that I've interviewed. It used to be there were about 20, 30, 40 books out there that they, that they could read. That's pretty much it. And you could watch WPT or you could watch old episodes of the WSOP from ESPN. Now, authors write 20 books. Now, there are hundreds of websites out there on how to learn poker better and different ways, tournament, cash, high stakes, low stakes, PLO, blah, 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 blah. And so it's so different now. Whereas in the past, you saw somebody, you knew they were an internet player. They probably did something. Now you have no idea based on, you cannot judge a book by its covers at all. You have no idea, you know, they could act like they don't know what they're doing. And all of a sudden they three bet you light and tell you that. And I even jokingly say, I don't, I can't believe they know the word light. Like, mm -hmm. you know, in the past, they wouldn't even yeah. know that. So how have you kept up with the game and how yeah. have you continued to get, because like you said, the game gets tougher end of story. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I would say that the, during those golden years of 2006 to 2011, I was pretty lazy. <laughs> I had, um, I, I was just a victim of success. You know, yeah. the fact that the games were easy, I didn't feel the need to study. I, and, and when I did study, it was modeling my game after a player that I, that I knew was good at a, at an online table. So I would like compare my stats because I would have all my hands in my Hold'em manager and I would see how often am I three betting from the small blind? How often am I flatting? What am I doing? And then I would take my subset of stats and I would go, and I, I remember there was this one guy, his, his name is, I believe his name is John Kim. I can't remember his online name. Um, but anyways, I would just compare my stats to him. And he was like crushing the cash games uh, on full tilt back in the day. And I'm like, oh, he's three betting more than I am from the small blind. Oh, he's flatting less from the big blind or like whatever it was. And then I would try to move my stats to equal to, his to stats. Equal his? <laughs> yeah. That's great. And that's, that that's was great. my way of studying. Um, that's great. And yeah, because yeah, there was yeah. no training sites, there was no like, right. what do I do from the small blind with ace queen? Um, so that's the way I would study back in the day. Also just talking hand histories with my brother um, sure. because my brother was proficient at the game, but he was also kind of in this, this same trap as me, the, the victim of success trap. 
Um, but then after the game started, I noticed the game started to get a little bit tougher. That's when I started, um, you know, diving in a little bit more and started talking with um, my brother a lot more about poker hands and also some other higher stakes players that I had become friends with. Um, shout out to Brian Kim. He's a high stakes player from the Los Angeles area. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would just run hand histories by, by people that were better than me. And then that eventually moved into paying attention to what uh, people were putting out on sites like Raise Your Edge. You know, I had a subscription to Raise Your Edge. What ranges are they using? Uh, what sizes are they using on certain board textures? Why are they using these sizings? And, and it's just like an all encompassing of like talking hand histories, t- paying advance, t- I'm sorry, paying attention to the solver world. You know, why are they using certain sizings on certain board textures? What ranges are they using? And that's, uh, that's just something that I had to do. Otherwise I was going to fall behind. You know, I couldn't right. just rely on playing solid, tight, strategy in position anymore you know right. i had to now know what range what are my ranges uh what are my bet sizings and you know basically looking at the game from a much more analytical view because i was just going to get eaten up and i had a good i had a good couple of years from like 2011 to 2016 were kind of like the height of my poker career when i was playing 510 and 1020 in the in the southern california area uh, making more money than I could ever imagine um, making uh, growing up. So it, w- it was like the time of my life and I thought it was going to last forever, but the games died. Um, the games got tougher. I, I, I moved back to online. So it's just as a cash game player, you're kind of just always hustling and always looking for the next best game right. and always kind of trying to stay on top of your own game. Um, so, it, but like, <laughs> it just, it's never going to be figured out because um you know, the game gets tougher, the games get harder to find. So it's not like other careers where you can like reach a certain point and just kind of coast. You kind of always have to be looking out for new games and, and staying on top of your own game. When you're in, you're in Vegas now, do you yeah. have certain casinos that's like go-to casinos that you, you know, that this is the one where I usually not really. do well honestly, or no? Like, yeah, no, honestly, uh, once you reach like the 510 no limit level and, and the yeah. 1020 area, you, you kind of need to be on the lookout for some private games. You, you can definitely survive with mixing in some 510 and 1020 at Bellagio. Um, and occasionally like good games will break out at the win on the weekends and things like that. Um, but you definitely should be mixing. You should be on the lookout for some private games uh, and mixing those in as well. So I play some private games on apps. And if, if someone um, has a, a decent, like for, for me, like a great private game would be something like Live at the Bike or something like Hustler right. Live Casino, yep, you know, yep, 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 yep. where they're going to assemble a good lineup. I have a platform on YouTube, so they'll they'll invite me to these games. Sure, I got sure. invited to play a WPT 50-100-100 game. I sold action to play in that game because I did not want to miss the opportunity. There was a businessman in the game that had lost 100000 So like, because I have this platform now, I'm able to stay on top of these invite-only games or in some of these uh-huh. private club games. Right. I still mix in the casino games, but it's it's tough, man. You got to, you got to, really put yourself out there to find the good games. And, and even when I do get in the games, it's, there's no guarantee I'm going to win. I got to stay right. on top of my study, you know, right. One right. of the ways I stay on top of my study is I, I stake and I coach some people and that kind of keeps me talking poker. They right. have questions for me all the time. If I'm not sure on something, I go to my brother. If my brother's not sure on something. He goes to his coach. Who's, who's a, a nosebleed, a, a high roller. So right. we kind of have this ecosystem of support that we kind of roll through. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk more with Johnny about his tremendous success on YouTube and talk about how that has really kind of taken over a lot of his time as well. We'll talk with that when we return here on the Bernard Lee Poker Show. <laughs> 